This is the Reba Future Architects podcast, and I'm delighted to be hosting today's episode. Reba, the Royal Institute of British Architects, is a global professional membership institute that represents architects and architecture. The Reba Future Architects program aims to support students and early career professionals during education and early stages in practice. Reba membership is free for any student studying in the part one or two Reba validated course. To join, just visit the website architecture.com. So today we'll be exploring disability in architectural education. Um, disabled voices have the potential to radically progress architectural education and the more diverse demographic universities is essential to ensuring that future architectural practice is enacted by those who understand the barriers faced by disabled communities in the built environment. This podcast will cover the limited representation of the disabled people and the struggles faced in architectural education, but primarily we will be talk, talking propositionally about what needs to change and how the REBA and universities can support this progression. I am joined today by three fellow early career leaders in the profession who have all contributed and continue to contribute to make an architectural practice education discourse equitable for all disabled people. We have Chris Lang, an architectural designer, activist, consultant, and founder of Sign Strokes. He has worked at Hallworth Tompkins since 2017 and completed his part two at the Royal College of Arts in 2021. We also have Poppy Leverson, an architectural student at Central St. Martins and part one architectural assistant at DSDHA. And finally, Dan Innes, a part two architectural assistant working in North London, who graduates from the Royal College of Art in 2021 and is about to start his part three at the University of Westminster. We are also supported today by two interpreters, um, Amy and Liam. Amy will be voicing Chris today in English, and that is who you'll be hearing for the rest of the podcast. Um, I'm going to hand over now to let Dan, Chris, and Poppy give their introductions, just so we know a little bit more about them. Um, Dan, would you like to go first? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so hi, I'm Daniel. Um, I was diagnosed with ADHD in the middle of COVID uh, while on my master's. Uh, I'm also, um, in addition to, to working as a part two, um, I'm also a champion for Architecture LGBT+, uh, which is a not-for-profit grassroots organisation that supports LGBTQ plus members of the architecture industry. Hi everyone, my name is Chris Lang. I'm deaf and a native BSL user. I am a co-founder of Sign Strokes, which is a BSL lexicon of architectural terms, and also Deaf Architectural Front DAF. I've been working at Hal Tompkins since 2017 as a part two architectural assistant. And I look forward to having a conversation with you today. Hi, I'm Poppy. I'm uh, finishing my third year at Central St. Martins. I'm registered blind and have a small amount of residual vision. Um, and I've been visually impaired since birth. Um, I'm now working at DSDHA and also with the Disordinary Architecture Project in developing a course with blind and so partially sighted architecture students. Thank you very much, everyone. So I'm really pleased to have us all together today. I think these conversations are well needed in both, you know, the discipline as a whole, um, but also I think in the REBA. So we will address a few things today, but the first one that I wanted to focus on was asking how does architecture education currently sort of fail disabled students? Um, and moving on from that more positively, how does it currently support them? So I think it'd be nice to hear, you know, each of your experiences in terms of its exemplar in both of those of failing and supporting. Um, who would like to chip in on that first? I mean, when I think about it, I'm, I'm struck by the incredible amount of work, um, that can be required by disabled students, um, just to get support in universities in the first place. And it's a little conflicting because, you know, that support is designed to kind of equalize the playing field. But then when, in order to access it, you have to spend huge amounts of time and energy whilst doing your course as well. It kind of, it comes a little bit challenging. Um, and for me, I, I certainly, I felt very much a sense of um, having to ration um, my energy very carefully during my master's because, you know, of course, the reason you're there is because you're studying and you want to do a good project um, and you don't really want to 
be distracted by you know basically doing admin and like fighting bureaucracy and trying to kind of undo all this red tape in order to get get basic support um but of course that's also important um so that was definitely like a challenge i faced and i think yes yes the process to um getting support from um, educational institutions was less bureaucratic um i think uh disabled students would um yeah find it a lot more accessible yeah um i found that i had a very similar experience i know at some of the worst times on my course i was spending about a day a week doing admin and just admin and when you're doing a full-time course you don't have a day a week and i've got a disability but i also have a chronic pain that goes with that and so i can't work i, I can't work seven days a week which is kind of expected of architecture school anyway and when you add like a whole day of admin which is often quite emotionally taxing admin like none of this admin is neutral when you're having to fight every day to just be in in a place and do the course that you love um it's not neutral and it's even more tiring yeah it's interesting and i kind i kind of feel the same as dan and poppy that great sense of responsibility um when i look back to my ba um i had a deaf disability advisor um they knew what i needed um and it meant that for instance when i had my ma experience it was quite different because i didn't have that in the same way in the same way um and also unfortunately the university that i went to to study my masters didn't have much knowledge in regards to my needs and budget and it was a constant battle so the dsa the disability support allowance isn't really enough to cover interpreters and so it ran out and so it meant that the university needed to, to top this up but I had to have a lot of conversations in regards to this because there was some pushback and therefore I had responsibility on my shoulders and I was already stressed by just doing a master's. So it was constant and it did affect me, you know, emotionally. And, you know, I was the only person needing support in that, in that university. I was the only deaf person studying. And so, yeah, I completely agree with, with what you've both said. Oh, uh, maybe just to, yeah, chime in. Yeah, I mean, hundred um, percent. Everything you guys are saying resonates, um, and I feel it's particularly um, resonant because right now, you know, we are studying and starting to work. Um, you know, during a pandemic, you know, when people are cut off and people are isolated, um, we have a cost of living crisis. University fees have never been higher, and so it's like. You literally just want to do your course and just do a good job, but it, you have this kind of swirling maelstrom of um, problems kind of sucking away at your energy every second. So I feel like the, these challenges we're talking about are particularly pronounced now for disabled students. Yeah, I think COVID's a really interesting point because it started in the first year of my BA and has been present the whole way through. Um, and unlike for a lot of disabled people, the pandemic actually made me significantly more disabled. The majority of the software used by the university to hold lectures and things, I just couldn't access the chat function, which was obviously often a huge part of a lecture. There would be a whole discussion going on that, and I told them that I, I couldn't access, but nothing ever changed. And I just sit there not really knowing what people were talking about. Um, and then on top of that, the, all of the software that's more generally used um, in architecture is inaccessible to me as a blind person. Um, often they block the accessibility software built in in the computer even. Um, and so this sort of switch to everything being digital and everything being online was really, really difficult to adjust to. Um, and even the reduction in contact time and things like that made a huge difference because Often the things that I needed to discuss with tutors would take longer. Um, so yeah, I think it's a it's a really interesting point because I know a lot of disabled people found the pandemic to be a really good thing. <laughs> Obviously not the pandemic, but the adjustments made by the pandemic, things like recorded lectures and being able to do things from home. Um, so I think it's 
it's just interesting to talk about how different people's experiences were from that. Yeah, I, I, I think the mental health there is really important. I mean, like you say, Poppy, I am one of those people that um, that was advantaged by the, by the pandemic in a way, in that I've been able to work for the last two years um, from my home quite comfortably. But I think this really highlights the fact that universities cannot homogenize disability into one thing or another um, because it affects all of us in such different ways. Um, so I think that's, you know, vital to consider. And now we, what we need to watch out for is that there isn't a sudden pushback to completely in person. There needs to be a much more complex understanding of the hybridity that we need in, in, in our stitcher schools. Yeah, I mean, I agree, COVID, wow, it was a huge impact, wasn't it, on our learning. And when I really think about the first three months of term and my university experience, it was it was a, a huge learning curve how to make this adjustment to working online via Zoom. I remember when I first went into Zoom, I was working with interpreters and trying to work out the different accounts and how we would all be able to see one another and pin one another. And also whether it'd be possible to actually find the interpreters in time. So for instance, when you set up a Zoom and there's 80 or 90 students, there would need to be enough time beforehand to pin the interpreters so that the lecture wouldn't start without me being able to gain access to them. So ordinarily, there should be always two interpreters for lectures. And this means that turn taking can take place. But unfortunately, there was a lack of um, understanding about being able to pin both interpreters and the interpreters then needing to swap. So one would work, I'd have them pinned and then I'd have to find where the other interpreter was every 15 minutes. So there were little details like this at the start that meant it was quite difficult and challenging. So it was a case of, you know, explaining, please beforehand, can we have some prep time to make sure that the interpreters are pinned and that also that there is prep for interpreters that are working. You know, not all the interpreters working were regular. And so there was lots of discussions being had. It was also a challenge for me at university um, because if you think about energy levels and being exhausted, I'm constantly watching the screen. And so I'm worn out because my energy levels are just focused on, on, on concentrating on the Zoom, whereas my hearing peers can look away from the screen and take an eye break, whereas I can't. So it was this incremental thing of me feeling that I was getting sort of further behind as the time progressed for sure that was something that i experienced and was a challenge for me so chris obviously you are the founder of sign strokes um which you explained at the beginning did you also find it difficult finding interpreters that could work with the language and architecture school that you frequently use yes because really there aren't many interpreters that are fully qualified that have worked with deaf students in an architectural setting. Maybe, let me think, if we think about deaf architects, for instance, there's four or five that are qualified in the UK. So that correlates to how many interpreters are available to work in those settings. I think registered, there's just under 1500 interpreters in the UK. So, you know, finding people who have worked already with deaf architects who are qualified um, with this relevant experience was really difficult. You know, it's 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 evident that in certain situations, um, I would be working with new interpreters and there'd be lots of spelling that would be taking place. Uh, instead of a sign being used for a word, there'd be lots of spelling. Um, you know, I need BSL to be able to easily and cohesively take in information and lots of spelling slows down this response. So for instance, when I'm learning a new subject, as I was in my master's and my BA, I'm looking at this jargon and thinking, I don't know what this word means. And um, there, if there isn't a sign for it, then this constant spelling is taking place. And that's another reason uh, why I set up sign strokes, uh, because it meant that there was a reference point and a jargon uh, lexicon that could be used by interpreters and, and by students in education. 
So it just meant that the language was there. So we had the signs and it meant it was more accessible for me and the interpreters working for me. So feel free to have your answer be no to this. Um, but have any of you encountered positive examples of support in architecture school, particularly related to architecture education and the various methods we have to do within that? Um, I, I have I have a little one, um, which is a maybe a little uh, double-edged sword, but I did find there were a few absolute heroes uh, at during my master's despite the system being kind of broken, I think, in some ways. There are a couple of people who just went over and above um, to compensate for that, you know, giving me their time, giving me their patience. Um, I was incredibly grateful for that. And I think it was only because of that that my project was able to develop in the way that it did. And so for me, that was hugely positive. Um, but I think the flip side of that is that I think if we're looking at kind of architectural pedagogy, I don't think we can rely on <laughs> staff who are already completely overworked, uh, especially because of COVID, um, having to overexert in order to compensate for a, a system that could quite easily be better. Yeah, I think I would sort of mirror that same thing again. It's like, um, I don't think there were generally any like positive things about architecture education for me I don't think there were any bits that were set up for me or had e were ever designed with someone like me in mind um but like with Dan it was there were a handful of people throughout my education that meant that it happened over not happening and yeah I it's a lot to ask of people and I think the other problem with with that is that it's very hit and miss um like I've met some people who have been great and who I would mention something that was difficult and would the next day I'd come in and they would have come up with a creative solution to it and it would have been fixed overnight and that's the kind of responses I needed to everything but unfortunately when you're relying on just a handful of people that doesn't happen um and yeah we're asking staff that have ha generally had no training on disability I know my university has some mandatory training when staff start, which in one session covers all kinds of marginalizations that someone could have. And the further disability training is non-mandatory and there was no access to it through COVID. So again, you're asking staff who've had no specific training to help students when, like Dan said, they're overworked, underpaid, tired and busy and stressed and all of those things and so yeah i think it's it's kind of not fair to just rely on the staff at the moment i mean what what both of those points illustrate is that it's the actual foundations of the pedagogy itself and not the people necessarily that are you know running it and doing the labor for it that's important i mean poppy you, you've spoken a lot to me about for example crits and the sort of the visual um yeah <laughs> focus of them and how that's been the challenge before <laughs> and uh, that sort of raises the questions of the methods that we use both to make and present things in architecture school which i feel personally isn't is obviously geared towards the visual but also it's quite inflexible sometimes in how people are welcome to kind of um receive information as well um do you want to say anything more about that, Bobby? Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think that's something I found. I remember going into crits and having this strange feeling where I'd made all this work on a computer screen. I'd have everything zoomed huge so I can just about see it. And then I'd pin everything up on a wall and suddenly I'm presenting this wall of work that I can't see myself. And I'm stood right next to it. Like I can see it and I know where everything is because I've just pinned it up. But I can't see the details. I can't read any of the writing. Um, and I'm pres and when I sit in crits for other people, I can't see the work that they're talking about. And I don't think as architects, we recognize enough the value of language and description of things. 
we're we're generally so visual i remember i used to make notes about projects and i would think through words and i'd have this huge document that would have all of my like thoughts and feelings and like references in the same way that sighted people would have a sketchbook and actually actually being kind of told off by a tutor for writing too much and how writing isn't proper architecture sort of thing um so i think yeah and i think it's it's something that's only getting worse um with the pandemic we saw a lot of architecture practices when they didn't have new buildings to talk about they got new visuals of things and everything went on instagram and it was all about how buildings looked um we're rarely talking about what the projects are um all the details that went into them it's it's purely just like a handful of images that sum up an entire project that has so much depth to it so yeah i've i've definitely found that as an issue for me but i also think it's if you flip it around it's a great opportunity to improve architecture if we really embrace this sort of linguistic element yeah also to add when i'm thinking about architectural education and i'm focusing on the positives i agree that individuals uh specific individuals really gave me a lot of support so two of my old students at tutors uh, were invaluable and a lot of my fellow peers as well all the way through were of a great support to me there were a number of issues in regards to how the course was taught so for instance throughout COVID there were only three opportunities for me to attend specific training linked to uh, the equipment that was used at my university so I'd need to, for instance, book a time slot because of COVID, but I'd also need to have an interpreter present. So I'd need to make sure that the interpreter was there as well as my time slot or that the workshop wasn't full. I also need to, to make allowances for time in regards to being able to access the interpreter and the instructions on a screen if it's remote, for instance. You know, I can't watch an instruction of something to do with metal work on Zoom as well as looking at the interpreter at the same time. So there were lots of occasions where I didn't have access to um, being in workshop settings because of the accessibility or lack of. And certainly that is an, an issue in, in architectural schools at the moment. These opportunities to learn about the, the technical elements of the job whether that be software or whether that be woodwork or metal, it's important that those are all in place. And for me, certainly, you know, I need to work in sort of consecutive fashion. I need to look at the interpreter and the instruction, and then I need to perhaps look at the screen and the visual representation of what I'm being taught and work in that way. And there often isn't that consideration in the way that all the methods of teaching. You know, when we think about what we're paying at university and what we get, I think there is um a disparity there and that's quite clear and experienced by many students and before we move on to the next point and another question is do you all feel like these mainly negative experiences you've had in architecture school made you more wary about going into architectural practice as well um i think for me um going into employment was going to well, I, I assumed it was going to be tricky, whatever. Um, the employment rate in the blind blind and visually impaired community is 25%, um, meaning 75% of people don't have a job. And even once you have a degree or higher, that's only 49% of people that have a job. So I was going into it being like, you know, there's a one in two chance that I get a job at the end of this, um, which... I think people don't really think about in general. I don't know any other students that were going, oh, will I get a job at the end of this because of their disability? I mean, I, there weren't any other disabled students. Um, I, and I count myself as very lucky for getting a job. Um, but then I think there's also this kind of um, issue with that where I'm kind of 
too grateful almost to have a job <laughs> um and i really like where i'm working but i do also think that there's this element of it's it's like with everything the, the more sort of grateful we are for these things the less we can critique when there are issues within them um so yeah i think that's that's kind of my point on it is the generally the employment in dis, in the disability community is is quite low in some regards, when I was thinking about architecture, you know, when I was very little, I thought, yes, my dream is to become an architect from the age of eight, but I didn't have any role models. I didn't know of any deaf architects. So who could I look to, to aspire to? But then when you think about the dream and then you look at the other side of it and all the barriers, all to, it, it's not straightforward to become an architect in this country as a deaf person. And when I'm thinking about workplaces, perhaps, or internships in the summer, you know, I was very lucky because Kingston University at my BA paid for my interpreters. So this was a huge benefit for me. You know, I've been working since 2016 and everything's gone very well for me. You know, I know what the working environment is like. So I had this pre-existing experience about architecture before I started my master's. And also when I was doing my BA, but, you know, do lots of young people who are deaf have this opportunity to go on a workplace or an internship? No, because there isn't the budgets present. You know, when we think about work experience opportunities, how would a deaf person attend when there is no budget for interpreters? So I definitely think that, you know, my experience at Howe Tompkins has been valuable. And, you know, I started there as an intern, having my work experience, and then I went back and have been working there ever since. But if I hadn't have had that opportunity and that work experience of that summer, I definitely think I would have found it difficult. It's a definite possibility that there would have been more barriers to me without that first experience. You need that first step. You need someone to give you an opportunity and you need the funding there and interpreters there. So that's, it's, it's accessible work and an accessible work experience. You know, when we think about work experience in regards to um, young school children as well in the workplace, there needs to be budgets for interpreters. So it, it all links in together because in order to think that you can go into a job, you need the confidence and with the confidence, you need the experience. And with the experience, you need the money. So you need the budget. And also, you know, it's exhausting thinking about, you know, the different ways of finding funds for different experiences, whether that be work experience or internships. You know, if you're the only deaf person in a working environment and nobody has sign language within that working setting, it's quite difficult because obviously as an architect, there's lots and lots of meetings that take place and you do need to have an interpreter. Um, without an interpreter, it would be impossible to, to follow and keep track. So these are all considerations that you think about. Yeah, for me, um, I think when I was considering, I mean, my last year of masters, I, I think probably quite like a lot of people I'd say was, was thinking, I cannot imagine myself doing architecture. Um, I think for me, um, at LRCA, considering kind of job prospects, I think the things that I find hard in a workplace setting, I think were common whether I went into architecture or um, something kind of adjacent to that. Um, I think the aspect of the architectural industry, which I think I feel constantly alert about is kind of overtime and, and overwork. Um, because honestly, I mean, where I'm right now, I'm incredibly grateful, um, as, as Poppy puts it, um, to, to be somewhere where I, I have a really good quality of life and have good working hours and a really good environment. But, you know, so many of my friends who've followed exactly the same kind of trajectory as me, you know, are working in huge practices and constantly working overtime. Like they can't, they can't come to evening things. They can't come to weekend things. They can't book time off even like months in advance because just in case the project might need it. Um, and yeah, I think honestly, I think 
if I were in that environment, I I think I would really find it incredibly hard to to stay in a job like that because I just think the effects of that. I mean, you know, I certainly wouldn't have time to to take part in discussions like this or, you know, what I do with architecture LGBT. So I think that was a that for me, I think that was the big consideration about um, my hesitancy about about the architectural industry. But you know, I guess uh, <laughs> you graduate and then at some point you think shit like. <laughs> How am I going to pay my rent? I guess I felt I had no choice but to just try and find something. But I guess you, going off what, what Chris has said, it's it does feel a little terrifying looking back at the precarity of some of the the moments that kind of form your kind of career progression. Because you think, my God, that could so easily have just not happened. You know, if there was someone there who didn't go out of their way to help me, or you know, if I didn't happen to meet that person, you know, it's like the whole. It feels that you feel like the whole thing could have just not happened. I mean, architecture as a discipline is a very social, sometimes clicky thing where if you know someone, you can go somewhere and get ahead quite easily. If you don't know them, it can be very challenging. And I think, again, coming back to COVID, I mean, I have been shielding for the last two years, only coming out more recently, the last few months. Um, and it can be very challenging to maintain or even create connections with people and move forward, um, which can make you feel like you're falling behind everyone else, which is just us. Um, feeling as if we're not giving enough to the discipline, which is a completely wrong way to feel about it, but that's how we're made to feel. Um, yeah, I think, Dan, what you raised about, you know, the overworking is a really vital thing. I think we spoke about it recently, Popping, I am Ian Dan, about how there's a lot of discussion made about architectural workers' rights and the overtime that a lot of people are being forced to do. And I think it also becomes an issue of disability rights because some of us just physically cannot do more than so many hours in the day. Whether it's sensory overload or, you know, or physically we just cannot manage it. Um, and Sometimes you are just fortunate to fall into a practice which is completely supportive of that. But I, I imagine there's a lot of people that fall into practices that aren't. And then that comes back to putting you in a very precarious position in the industry um, where you have to rely on not even the kindness, but just the decency of someone to support you with what you need. Um, so thank you for that, everyone. I think to sort of move, move things forward to sort of a more propositional speculative um, tired would have been quite nice. Um, obviously, one thing that's happened recently, and this comes back to this sort of the pedagogy question, is the ARB, the Architect Registration Board, is has come and done the report, or recently done the report on modernising architectural education, um, which very clearly did not include any direct thought about disabled people. And disabled students, disabled practitioners, um, which I thought was a um, interesting omission on their part. But what it means is that there is an opportunity now where architectural pedagogy can quite dramatically change, both in terms of the methods they use, the content, and even the structure by how which you, you know how you qualify. So, because, so f through that. Um, first question I wanted to ask is, do you feel like the, who do you feel like that we're responsible for enacting these changes once the ARB actually puts them in place? You know, so we've said that architectural staff in universities are already pushed to the limits. They're striking when they need to do it because there will be no works as well. So is it the ARB's responsibility to ensure that the curriculums that they already put in place in architecture school are as equitable and supportive as possible? Is it also Reba's responsibility to ensure it's happening? Or is it the leaders of these architecture schools themselves? What do you think? I think I think Reba and ARB have a lot of potential to do a lot more. I would say I think there is a difference between saying who has the responsibility and who has the power. Because, you know, to some extent, I think we can say that you know, power occupies a lot of different places. But in terms of responsibility, 
I I don't think we can really say anyone is more responsible than you know the professional bodies that represent us. Um, and you know I think that starts with things like this. I think that starts with creating platforms where you're giving space to disabled people to to have these discussions. But I think that is only the start. I don't think it's really substantive until you you start inviting disabled people and you know this applies to other liber liberation groups as well this doesn't it does, it's not substantive and, until you invite them to the decision making table as well and i think you know when you look at the problems that exist uh in a lot of universities so often i i, I find myself thinking god if there were just a couple of people on who you know holding the keys so to speak who if you understood something of what it was like, this would be such an easier conversation. And I think, you know, as you're saying, Jordan, like with the problems of staff just being incredibly overworked, I don't think we can say, oh, well, it's up to the schools. No, like, you know, <laughs> if we've got a professional body, like they need to be representing us. And that doesn't just mean, you know, people who are able-bodied or, you know, et cetera. Yeah, I find, I find it very frustrating at times. Uh -huh. I think one comes to pop in Chris, but I'll just say I think one key challenge is that, um, and we've all picked up on this before in various conversations, is that because there are so few disabled architectural students, either prospective or in education or graduated, it almost feels like sometimes that you don't have a a critical mass to be able to you know create change or even to be heard by. ARB or by Reeve or whoever to therefore, you know, have have an impact on the changes that are happening uh, or not happening. Uh, and I think that is one thing that is not possible to change in the short term. You can't just all of a sudden have a greater influx of disabled students as much as it would be great to. Um, but I think it's, that's also part of what the ARB I think needs to address is that not just, okay, what happens to students when they're in architecture school, but how is architecture school created and framed so that students who are thinking about going actually feel comfortable doing it, actually feel like when they get into architecture school, they're going to be supported, that they think they have a variety of pedagogies to, of like methods to use. So if you are visually impaired or blind or deaf or neurodivergent or in a wheelchair, you're not going to be limited to what you can do. I feel definitely RIBA has a responsibility and they have a huge amount of power because they influence practice. Um, they both do the ARB and the RIBA. Obviously the way in which practice is taught in schools needs adaptating and being bespoke to students. There's no information for students who are deaf wanting to attend universities and how they can have that experience at university and that information needs to be present. For instance, when I'm thinking about my part three and the exam, which is in written form, there is no facility for me to do this in BSL. So I would want to do the exam in BSL, not in written form. So do I contact RIBA and the ARB because both need to acknowledge the need for full access for the part three so that I can do the exam. And obviously they have the power to make these changes and um, adapt policy to make more students want to become architects and also do each stage as they should do. So they need to link together and work together to make architecture more accessible as a whole. And this is another reason why I've postponed my part three is because at the moment, if I was to take the exam, I would be doing this all in written form. And I'm having to have discussions at the moment with my university in relation to how I can uh, do the exam in part three. So, you know, at the moment, it's Westminster that I'm having these discussions with. But again... The powers that be, the ARB and the RIBA, need to work together on this. Barbara, did you want to anything on that? Yeah, I think um, if you only have to look at where the information is for non-disabled students wanting to get into architecture. 
to see where the responsibility is. Um, and I think the RIBA website is a really key example of that. Um, I've spoken to a few other disabled people in architecture about this before. There's these really quite pathetic guides about getting into architecture as a disabled person, which are not in accessible formats. They basically just tell you how any disabled person would go to university in how to apply for disabled students allowance or things like this with no specifics to architecture. And they're filled with these quotes from people who have no context. So you have no idea who they are um, saying really positive things about their experience. And I think this is kind of damaging in a way, like all of us have said, we've had horrible experiences and we've had really tough experiences. That's not to say that we wouldn't want to do it again and that we don't want to be in architecture, but I think it's, it's wrong to say that people coming into the profession now aren't going to struggle, particularly disabled people aren't going to struggle. They're going to have to fight all the time. And there is absolutely no information that is disability specific and architecture specific about starting university. I had no resources coming into it. Um, and then you're put in the sort of hands of the university that they have no experience of how, but in my case, a blind person does architecture. They're asking me what I need and I'm saying, I don't know. And like my disability advisor, the first time I met him openly said, oh yeah, I'm, I'm more, I'm more used to dealing with, uh, dyslexic students. I don't really know anything about blind people. And so I think, I think, yeah, the RIBA primarily, but then also the ARB as people move further through the profession have a huge responsibility. But I also think um, it needs to be, there needs to be some more joined up thinking. They need to get disabled people involved. There needs to be a way of knowledge sharing because I'm really worried. Like I've been at Central St. Martin's for three years and I honestly don't think me being there will have changed anything for a disabled student coming through after me. None of that knowledge is kept. There's, there's a changeover of staff. And again, it's relying on staff to retain that information. And similarly, if a blind student was starting at a different university in the UK, if they didn't contact me directly, there is no way of getting that knowledge. Um, all of the just tiny things that you've learned. I mean, I, through the Architecture Beyond Sight course, have learned so much about being in workshops from a furniture designer who is lives in Tasmania, who comes over and takes part, helps teach on the course. And there's all of these things, like specific tools that are accessible. But if you Googled that tool, there's nothing about how it's accessible. He's just done the hard work to find that out. And so we need a way of knowledge sharing between disabled people as well to make sure that this sort of wealth of knowledge that each one of us has created in how we adapt the world around us to make architecture in some ways work for us needs to be shared and i think again it would be great if someone like reba could fund that because it's not something that we can do for free because we're all overworked generally yeah i mean that's that's many pretty points there poppy i mean <laughs> just just the idea of someone who's a part one coming into their very first day of their course. And, you know, university is scary enough as it is. Architecture school, sometimes even more so. Um, the idea of coming into that and being expected to teach the school about what you need in a, in a course that you had never studied before and stuff you are learning yourself, it's quite a scary prospect. So. You know, and, and that's the sort of person we are thinking about when we worry about these things. You know, we've gone through it now. We've done, we've, we've dealt with it and we're still dealing with it, but we've gone through for many years of it. Um, but it's that person where change can really happen, hopefully. And yeah, I think, I think the change over starts really going as well. You know, architecture school is, is so in flux all the time. Students just come in and out every year. There's very rarely sort of people that are there for more than four or five years. Um, so knowledge sharing between them is even less likely, um, which is why this, you know, this needs to be a top down thing. It shouldn't necessarily, shouldn't only be about 
the stable students informing the way that change happens. It should be about how to inform that change higher up and it comes down to us um, and sort of keep the students as well. I mean, obviously, the, the common structure we have now is part one, part two, part three. Do you all think that, that structure is limiting for disabled students? Is it too long, for example? I'm going to jump straight in on this one and say, I think there's an issue in architecture where everyone wants to do that seven years in seven years. They want to they wanna be the youngest architect. They want to qualify as soon as possible. And I think that whole narrative is so unhelpful, so unhelpful. And it has this sort of cult of youth element to it as well, where we value young people that have done things really quickly. Um, I know I took an art foundation before I started university and deferred my place to, to do that because I needed a year where I was living at home to get my chronic pain under control. I've then taken my degree over four years because I wasn't getting the accommodations that I needed and I needed more time. And so if you add even those two years to that length, I'm not going to be an architect in that seven year window that people talk about, especially when you're young, like young in the profession, it's like, oh yeah, it's seven years. That's like what people say. Um, and so I think the, my worry with the, the process changing is that if there's any way of speeding it up, people will take that opportunity when what we really need to be doing is valuing the experiences that people get along the way. Like if you're a doctor, yes, you become a doctor, but you continue getting further qualifications through your profession. Often there is, um, like it's valuable the experience that people have and i think um it would be good if architecture could embrace that um instead of racing everyone to try and do it as quickly we should value what we've learned along the way and what comes with that is that it needs to be viable to live whilst you're still in that training you need to be able to live on a part one salary you need to be able to live on a part two salary you need to be able to afford to do a th three years for your master's or four or five years for your degree. And if, if that funding and that salary isn't there, then we're exacerbating the issue. Yeah, because I've, I've seen some people suggesting that they want to contract the, the BA or even the master's into two years or one year, which I think considering what we all went through in those courses sounds absolutely insane. Um, to try and do that. When we're thinking about part one, part two, and part three in those steps, I wouldn't say that it's really, really clear, certainly for the deaf community, about those steps and stages. You know, the resources are very limiting. And so you're learning as you're going in many respects. And also, if I'm really honest, if I knew that these processes and steps weren't, as ac weren't that accessible, and the journey to qualification was going to be this long, would I have carried on the process knowing how difficult it was going to be? You know, if young deaf people want to become architects, they need to know that there is going to be an access pathway for them. There isn't going to be constant barriers. For instance, when I started my interior architecture BA course, because my confidence was a little bit up and down, I was thinking I couldn't be an architect. I think I'll have to do interior. And that's because there wasn't enough resources for me that made me think, yeah, I can become an architect. And there wasn't also a role model. So if I'd had that information sooner, I think I would have gone straight to architecture and I wouldn't have done my first BA in interior architecture. And also the part three has the PE, PDER. And so if there's no resources in BSL and it's all in English, these steps means that everything is is a lot more uh, drawn out. And I think it's a challenge in that sense. There needs to be some flex flexibility and there needs to be a clear template of the different stages and how long it takes. So yeah, I mean, I, I think even framing it as the part one, two and three, almost 
it makes you feel like you have to complete those parts, right? You can't, you know, a, a lot of people do go off after the part one to do something else, or now part two and do something else. I mean, I don't even know if I'm going to try and qualify for my part three, partly because I haven't done my PDRs at all yet. Um, <laughs> but also because sometimes going into architecture practice just isn't for you. You don't want to go into research or even a completely different profession that's related to architecture. So I feel like there's this kind of pressure to finish all of them, um, not just in the seven years, but just as a whole, um, which I think can um, also be limiting, especially since part three is purely about getting into practice, understanding how practice works and becoming qualified. I certainly think, I think to say that the only way that you can legally call yourself an architect in the UK is to undergo a minimum seven, average nine year process, I think is, I think it's kind of astonishing. Um, I, I think we would benefit significantly from designing more flexible or alternate routes to practice. And I know there are a few actually, I don't know a lot about them, but I know a few exist um, at unis. Um, but for example, I mean, my master's was, um, I, I, despite all the challenges, I, I enjoyed it immensely and it contributed immensely to my spatial thinking. But do I consider it essential to my day-to-day -day practice now? No, not particularly. I think it added a lot, but I think to say that absolutely everyone who wants to become an architect has to go, go through the two, two and a half degrees. I think it's bonkers, to be honest. Um, I don't have any <laughs> particularly kind of clear propositions of, of brilliant ways of changing that particularly, but then going back to our, what we're saying, I think that is what, what ARB particularly can do. Um, I think we have this incredibly kind of static and flexible model, which works great a lot of the time and for some people, but doesn't work great all the time and doesn't work great for everyone. I, I think it just needs to be you know, a acknowledgement and attention to detail in that from the ARB that having a, a structural change to how you become an architect or how, it, or how architecture school works, can, it can have a detr detrimental effect possibly on several students, both current and future. So we need to, you know, we need to ensure, or they need to ensure more so, that the changes they do actually benefit those students instead. Um, now. I don't expect us to come up with a fantastic scheme for how to do that today. Um, but I think it's something that we could talk about. I mean, but more generally, what I wanted to ask you all is, what changes do you think, from your perspective, in your disability, need to happen to support disabled students and even encourage disabled students to join the discipline? Um, you know, what would you want to see or what would you have wanted when you started that would have made the process so much easier we touched on them today but i think it'd be nice to think about what can happen now um what can we would do what can the arb do what can architecture schools do um and do we need something beyond those three things to enable that support or should we need something beyond the three things to enable that support um, I think um, kind of what I was talking about earlier with having a way of knowledge sharing is something that I really wish that I'd had. Um, admittedly, for me, it's quite a difficult one because there aren't really many blind architects generally. I know one and I know of another. Um, I'm, neither of them are British and neither of them were blind when they trained to be architects. I'm sure there are others in the UK or visually impaired architects in the UK that I'm not aware of. Um, but I think even knowing the few disabled architects slash architect students that I did was one of the key things that got me through it. Um, kind of being reminded that other people are doing the same thing and some were people that you could kind of rant to a little bit and just completely got it when you spoke to them um, was such a big thing and that's without any sort of specifics to my situation um, because they have very different disabilities to me um, so I think 
if I'd had some sort of mentor system would be amazing if someone like the RBA had a group of disabled architects and you got paired up with someone who had some way to resonate with your situation in a way that you could discuss how they manage their access needs but also could just talk experiences and have an understanding of that would be um, so valuable and also does a lot for that representation because I think if we're talking about people getting into the profession that that are thinking about getting into being an architecture student you need you need representation for people to think that they can come into the profession but then once they're in the profession once they've started architecture school they then need that support and it would be really great if we could have a, a sort of funded way of linking people up to do that knowledge sharing um a bit like how you have the reba mentoring anyway that's my kind of initial thoughts i 100 percent agree with you poppy um and it makes you think that i think you know i think discussions like this kind of contribute uh to that a little bit in in kind of the sense of community building um that kind of in a more collective sense um there are a lot of neurodiverse neurodiverse designers out there but unfortunately um it's so incredibly under discussed that i could almost not tell you another architect i know who kind of openly talks about adhd even though i know that many exist and i think certainly you know I mean, at RCA, I, I set up um, the RCA Neurodiverse Society. And um, for me, the thing that was really wonderful about that was that finally, as, as Poppy mentioned, you know, you have a room of people who you, you can kind of just rant to and just speak to. And suddenly you realize, wow, it isn't just me. He's, you know, just super exhausted all the time and everything else. Um, I mean, that's, that, that's something that I find very exciting about you know, what's happening with like Disc Collective, for example, and also, you know, more broadly like Future Architects Front. Like, I think it's amazing that we are finally able to have these spaces where these conversations that probably everyone has been wanting to have for so long, we're actually able to have. Um, that's that's where I think a lot of my optimism about the future lies. Really, I wish that I'd established Deaf Architectural Front a few years ago. Um, but I think that RIBA needs to provide resources on the pathway for young people wanting to become architects. I think they need to be more um, attuned to the needs of different people who want to study. Um, and I think that young deaf people need to be able to know that uh, a job in architecture is for them. And that means there needs to be the support there. There needs to be a connection between the RIBA and the schools. And there also needs to be the resources there as well as the resources by the universities in BSL. I mean, obviously, Deaf Architectural Front will be creating some resources that will be available. Um, but, you know, I want young people to not have to worry about the process of becoming an architect. I think the RIBA needs to think about the different disabilities that exist in our communities and research these thoroughly and have resources and approaches for these different students so that everything is covered so that we are we are all together as one but we all have the support that we need i need to know that there's a place and a person i can go to to have a conversation with with an interpreter present about becoming an architect and you know all these things would have definitely helped me in my journey had i had them five six years ago and I think that the RIBA needs to raise its game and be a lot more supportive to different students with different disabilities who want to engage in higher education and access practice. And another thing that really needs to be pushed from, from my perspective is how, how do we improve outreach to disabled students? Um, how, how do you tell them that what they're going into is going to be suitable and accessible? I mean... It's a, it's a difficult argument because in one sense you can't really competently tell them that until you've fixed <laughs> after just go and made it accessible um, but in the same sense we want people in now, we want them joining we want them to get excited about the prospect of being an architect or a designer or researcher etc um, and I think that's where you know I think 
things like Libra Future Architects and Libra just generally can play a really good role there. You know, I know that places like the, the NSA um, and Open City Accelerate, you know, these programs are, and the NSA, for example, is trying to set up a part zero, I think, to um, establish links with younger students to get into architecture school. Um, Accelerate does work putting me in that area as well. But how does that also become accessible for um, disabled students? Because if those courses are based on the methods and practices we use in architectural education currently, are they too going to be inaccessible? So how do we ensure that those, those forms of outreach are also exploring new ways of creating and making and discussing and providing interpreters and providing, you know, non-visual information or describing it properly, etc. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's a real challenge. Um, and it's a weird situation because it, it kind of falls on us having to have this conversation a little bit. If we just left it, it would probably not change. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to take that responsibility if it means someone in the future doesn't have to do it. Um, if that's my career, I'd be happy with that. I found the moment. The biggest thing for me is so often the issues I face um, stem from people just not thinking about disabled people. It's not that people, it's often not that people are actively discriminating against, which obviously does happen, but more often than not, it's that people and companies and organizations have not thought about disabled people, or they've not thought about the breadth of the disability community. Um, a key example of this is things that will say that they are quote unquote fully accessible, but make no reference to blindness or deafness or um, neurodiversity. There, it's purely it's wheelchair accessible or often very limited wheelchair accessibility, but it'll still claim fully accessible. And so often these things are just no one has thought about it. And part of that is that there are very few of us, and so the people aren't reminded. But even when we are there, constantly saying it, people still don't think it. And so to anyone that's listening to this, all I ask as a starting point, if you want to be an ally, is just think about how that might affect disabled people. And if you don't know how it's going to affect disabled people, ask someone especially if you're hosting events or things that should be accessible to everyone, especially when companies, organizations claim to be accessible and welcoming to everyone, which generally the architect profession is, is quite welcoming. People are generally quite progressive. Just think about disabled people. <laughs> I agree with, with everything that you just touch, touched upon Poppy. And when I think about, for instance, deaf space, I think there's a, a lack of knowledge and understanding about what deaf space is and how it's used in practice. For instance, it was established in America in 2005, but there's no information or guidance linked to, linked to deaf space here in the UK. A lot of the focus is on um, hearing loops, uh, wheelchair access, but there is nothing in response to how environmental spaces are used um, in a sense of how people communicate with, with one another. Um, so if deaf space was taught in university settings, um, that would give a better awareness about the deaf community and its needs. And also that would mean that people working in the built environment in architecture would have that deaf awareness and know about deaf space. I think perhaps when we're thinking about the criteria and the way that modules are taught in universities, that disability needs to be considered in those actual models so that architecture and disability uh, are aligned in that sense. And, and maybe just to follow on from that, it reminds me of something I, I thought earlier, um, which is that certainly my experience was that it felt like discussions about disability were largely relegate, uh, delegated to um, you know, a student support team. And there was kind of a sense that when it came to the academic department, it's like, oh, well, that's, that's not our quote unquote problem. And I think if there was more joined up thinking 
as people have said today, like if there was more of an understanding of that that kind of shared responsibility, I think we it won't be quite so hard to have these discussions. It'll be a lot easier to kind of get stuff going, you know. I mean, I think you've also touched on various points that I think relate to, you know, the current work that it's going on at the moment. So um, we are in the very early stage of trying to establish somewhat of a disabled architecture network in the UK, which we hope to really kind of address a lot of the issues we've raised today, but also address the the kind of isolation of disabled students in different universities where you are the only person there. You, know, you have no person, I'm a person to speak to. You know, you are surrounded by able students, able tutors, able staff in general, um, and in some cases, a disability support that doesn't really understand your own disability. Um, and so we are hoping that this network actually provides a place to offer support, offer a network, offer sort of a collectivity that you can um, be part of. And that also maybe starts to have an actual impact on architecture schools themselves. Because I think, you know, us coming together like this today, I think is brilliant. And if we had 10 times more of us, it'd be even greater. Um, and I'm sure we're all out there somewhere. And I think it's just making sure that we're not alone in it. So hopefully we can try and put details about this group and how to sort of inquire about it um, in the text that company in this podcast. Um, it's been absolutely brilliant today. Um, I want to thank all of you for joining us and being part of this very, sort of very insightful We Have a Future Architects podcast. Please don't forget to check out the full Future Architects program on the Reba website, architecture.com, and on Instagram at Reba Education. Thank you to our listeners. Um, we hope you have learned something and that this podcast has given you an opportunity to think about something new. Um, we're so pleased to have been part of this and thank you so much for listening. You know, I want to echo Poppy. Think of disabled people. Next time you're thinking of something in architecture, think of us as well. Um, I think that's a good method to take away from this. Thank you for listening and look out for the new episode coming soon. Reba acknowledges the comments made in this episode regarding accessibility in architectural education. We will review and assess the commentary to support our work to make our profession open to everyone.